All right, here we are. Another episode of Breaking Changes. I'm pretty excited. Today, I've got a, a, an old friend of mine that I've worked with at, uh, several times across government uh, API issues in federal government. And now, um, Kelly Taylor is the director of Colorado Digital Services. Welcome, Kelly. Hey, Ken. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad we could make this work. We we were going to try to uh, make this happen at another time, but uh I guess the internet was melting down and 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 so we uh we were able to flex and and find this other slot to make make it all work. But let's dive in. Um what's the Colorado Digital Services? So we are a small team of product managers, designers, engineers, kind of bureaucracy hackers. Uh, that work for Governor Polis on some of the state of Colorado's, you know, toughest, most unusual uh, software problems. Um, it's a, a fork from the U.S. Digital Service. I just, you know, copy pasted a bunch of ideas um, and experiences over and, and applied it here in Colorado. And, um, it, you know, it's been really interesting because we we started the team. Uh, you know, we are state employees. We are within the, the, the larger Office of Information Technology here in the state, a thousand person you know, agency in the state. And we were really hoping we could work on some meaningful things. And uh, a couple months into starting the team, you know, COVID came along. So a lot of our work is focused uh, on public health, on the COVID response, on kind of data interoperability um, in, in that vein. So it's been a, a pretty crazy experience and now that we, you know, here in the state, we're 70% vaccination rate and, um, you know, our numbers have, have mostly come down. We're starting to get a chance to work on some of the other, you know, priorities of, of the state of Colorado government, which has been really great. Nice. So why, I mean, in the, in the context of Colorado, but other states, why does the state need a, a, a digital services group like this? Yeah, well, you know, one of the interesting things about the, the digital service model is it's a tour service model, meaning people come into the government for some sort of, you know, tour service, like six months up to two years. And that's how we do it here in Colorado. Uh, there's other states like New Jersey that have digital service teams. And it's it's nice because what it does is kind of gives the opportunity to the broader you know, tech ecosystem here in Colorado, we have our kind of Boulder Denver tech corridor with a, a million awesome startups and tech stars and foundry group and, you know, lots of, you know, headquarters for a bunch of cool tech companies. You have a lot of like the cybersecurity stuff in Colorado Springs and Fort Collins. And, and it's, a, it's like this huge tech community. Um, and it gives folks in that community this nice interface to come into government to, you know, help with all the experience they've gained in the private sector and, and apply that to some government problems and then roll back out to the private sector or maybe like me fall in love with government and, and continue on kind of working on government problems so the model is super cool and um and it's something that you you saw start um about 10 years ago in the uk with the formation of the the um gds the, the government digital service there and then the u.s digital service came about uh, after the the crash and rescue of of healthcare.gov and since then there's you know a huge ecosystem of variety of different ideas and ways that that kind of tech people can plug in and help yeah it's a it's a powerful model i mean to set some context a little bit of history how uh kelly and i know each other is i worked in the obama administration as a presidential innovation fellow so this is 2013 and I had the pleasure of working with a lot of the smart people who were behind the U.S. Digital Services, as well as 18F. And speaking personally, as this uh, West Coast, Oregon, I grew up in Oregon. I grew up very libertarian, uh, honestly anti-government. Um, I, you know, went into the the tech sector in the 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Really did a lot of startup work really didn't have much interest in government, didn't care about government, really didn't believe government was, was it, it, it wasn't needed. And then I went and, and worked for the Obama administration and it changed my tune. It, it not only left me similar to you, loving government and, and the problems and the scope of problems, 
it gave me a new appreciation for how this country works or often doesn't work. And so anybody listening to this, uh, you know, any of these digital services model, what what works for you, I, I highly recommend it if, if you can step away from your career for a while, because it will change your view of the landscape. It will change how you see the world uh, and, and, and the role of government. And I would say that tango between the public and the private sector, I think is, is, is really key. So we, you touched on, alluded to it briefly. So what kind of stuff did you do at U.S. Digital Services while you were in D.C.? Uh, so at the U.S. Digital Service, uh, there's a bunch of different teams uh, kind of within the broader U.S. Digital Service. And so I was on the, the healthcare team working for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And uh, I had come from IBM Watson Health and Alchemy API and a, and a couple of things like that. So my background is a, is a product manager. And so I started working on kind of API type of problems there, of course, hence this podcast, right? Um, and so I, I worked on a couple of different things um, in the government, just like in the private sector, you know, you see these types of APIs like transactional APIs or open data APIs or kind of PHI, PII type of, of APIs where government's the data holder. So I worked on a, there's a program called the Quality Payments Program, which is when, when doctors submit information to the Centers for Medicare about the quality and, and the type of care that they're providing, um, they get paid at a higher rate. They get reimbursed at a higher rate. So it's worthwhile for doctors to submit this data, and but submitting the data is cumbersome. So we worked on an API that could integrate with electronic medical record systems that allow doctors to automatically submit data to CMS. So that's like an example of transactional stuff. And then, but most of my work there was on an API called the Medicare Blue Button API. And this is a concept uh, that started about a decade ago from people like Anish Chopra uh, that talked about how the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, you know, they're, they're the, they hold Medicare data. You know, CMS administers Medicare in the United States, 45 or so million people, 10,000 new seniors come onto the program every single day. And every time a senior goes to the doctor, the doctor bills Medicare for that. So CMS has this, this kind of a huge, you know, uh, data store of, of insurance claims. Same with the VA, you know, the VA provides care to veterans, same exact situation. A veteran goes to the VA hospital and, you know, the VA pays that insurance claim. So those are the two places that people like Anish Chopra push to um, make data available to veterans or seniors on Medicare. And that experience looked like a, an end user, you know, a veteran, a patient, a, a senior on Medicare logging into a portal like mymedicare.gov and downloading a CSV of their data. So that started a decade ago. And when I came along, the chatter at, at CMS and the U.S. Digital Service team and a bunch of smart people were was, um, hey, we should turn this into an API because it's, it's not having access to the inf information that's powerful. It's being able to share it with apps and clinical trials and your doctor and so on that makes it really, really powerful. So that started down the road of, of building this blue button API while I was there. So that was the majority of the, the work over two year period at, at CMS and the US Digital Service. So what? who are the consumers of, of that API? What, what gets built on that API? Yeah, so when you think about the healthcare industry, it's, you know, it, it's like pharma companies, Health, you know, healthcare and doctors, fitness type of, you know, be healthy types of things. And, um, and it's an array of all of those types of companies, big and small. So we had um, companies that run clinical trials. They, they would uh, integrate with the Blue Button API. So a patient is going to enroll in a clinical trial. And the old way is that company saying, all right, let's get, you know, history on you. Let's get all sorts of information. The new way is the patient shares their, you know, five years of their Medicare claims history with the trial, you know, with the trial software. And so now the trial understands what procedures they've had, what, what prescriptions, medication they've been on and so on. And so it's just a very quick way. So same with, uh, with, you know, electronic medical records. So a patient is in the waiting room, they're handed an iPad to check into their appointment. And, you know, certain kind of electronic medical record vendors have integrated with this API. So the patient could, you know, touch to connect their information. And now their physician has, you know, five years of their claims history. Um, 
these use cases, you know, often go to like the personal health record, you know, like Apple Health, you connect, you know, today Apple Health integrates with hundreds of electronic medical record providers like the University of Colorado right down the street here. And um, soon we'll hopefully integrate with claims, you know, using something like the Blue Button API and other private health insurance claims uh, APIs. And that gives gives the, you know, the end user like me and you and everybody listening, uh, you know, all their information on their phone. So that stuff's very powerful, um, especially on the phone. You can start sharing information with other apps, which is very powerful. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an interesting area because like with many APIs, you know, you can kind of talk like all day long about the various use cases, which is really fun. Um, with the blue button kind of in the early days, clinical trials, EHR integrations, and then lots of startups. That was the, you know, our first kind of cohort of companies we had, as we were building the API, we had a, a couple hundred companies that were experimenting with it. And then, you know, an API like that, it's interesting because as you go from sandbox to a production, you know, there's a process there of, of giving companies access to personal health information. And, um, so, you know, that that couple hundred companies goes way down to more like, you know, 50, 100 type of companies that have been vetted and and gone through the process. But um, it really it was a nice range. So you'd see things like um, a, per, a Medicare beneficiary wanting to go from traditional Medicare to a Medicare Advantage plan, which is a different type of health insurance that gives them kind of different types of benefits. And so there was like cost calculators and various things. So you want to determine, you know, you want to understand the best plan for you. You connect your existing, you know, five years of your claims history and, you know, whatever calculator you're using can say, Hey, all right, based on what you just shared with me, these last five years, here are the best plans for you. And there's a lot of that kind of shopping calculator stuff that we saw early days as well. So you touched on a little bit, you know, going from sandbox production, what's, what were the biggest challenges in rolling out an API like this? Cause it sounds like a no brainer, but Knowing that, you know, devil's in the details, what were the biggest challenges of opening up that API? Yeah, so, you know, in, in government, APIs in general are new. And that's a that's a generic statement, but um, they were relatively new at CMS. You know, there were a couple of teams that were building APIs with like business partners. But this idea of a, an API that's public to any developer that wants to use it, it sits on top of very valuable, you know, information that needs to stay secure. You know, that's a big thing, big new thing for government. And now many, many governments are you know, at all levels, federal, state, local, are, are starting to build APIs like this. Um, for us, I think that the biggest challenges were policy related things like that, where, um, you know, the, the first question when you meet with with a lawyer from HHS or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid was, mm -hmm. okay, how, how can we make sure that, you know, we can trust the people who are we're giving access to this information, you know, the, the third party developers. And, um, and it's an interesting question because ultimately it's up to the patient. You know, there's mm -hmm. lots of legislation. Um, one example mm -hmm. is HIPAA, the HIPAA right to access that says patients have, an, have a right to access their information. That's why you can walk into your doctor's office and walk out with a CD-ROM of your, you know, MRI of your knee or whatever, like that, that kind of classic example. Um, and an API is no different. So a big part of this was proving the case that, you know, an OAuth experience is very similar to a digital signature, you know, so that should count as a patient saying, yes, I authorize this third party app to use my data. Um, so there was lots of meetings like that, and and the the third party kind of app developer vetting process was also brand new. So I looked around at a bunch of different, you know, how different companies did this. Like how Dropbox does it is very different than an, another company. You know, sometimes it's based on just general usage. Like I think Dropbox was like you had to have 50 users connected to your sample app, and then it could go to production automatically. Um, very different than an app store experience where like your code is being scanned. You know, so. On our team, we came up with our own experience in our own kind of process, which involved the the team vetting the application, um, the the dev team plus you know folks from CMS, um, security folks, and we had you know developer guidelines and parameters. So for example, like you couldn't be re you couldn't resell the information, you know things like that. And um, as long as someone met the criteria um, and we felt good about it, we would go ahead and give them production access. 
Now, one interesting thing that's happening is, um, you know, how you scale that. So I mentioned Medicare, you know, all of the information from 45 plus million people, you know, it's comes into one spot. And so you have one team that kind of oversees that. But what, when you have programs like Medicaid, which are now building very similar APIs, um, you know, 50 states, every state has multiple Medicaid plans. So you're talking now hundreds and hundreds of Medicaid plans. So if you're a developer at a startup and the goal is to serve the Medicaid population with home delivery of prescription drugs, clinical trial enrollment, personal health record, whatever the thing is you're doing, um, are you now having to go to hundreds of developer portals, manage hundreds of API keys and so on? And so that's kind of the next chapter of all this stuff where it starts to get really interesting. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of unknown unknowns in there that, that policy stuff always surprised me and how, like when I first started doing developer portal stuff at the Department of Veterans Affairs, you know, a fundamental part of, of doing your API is asking developers to like do little things for you. Hey, can, you know, we need help with this. Hey, can you do this? And then I remember my boss telling me, Hey, you work in government now. You can't tell people to do things for you. That's not how it works in government. I'm like, but uh, like little things like that always tripped me up and all the way to, you know, I think we did a, a benefits questionnaire iPad app for uh, disability claims and, and helping reduce friction for veterans getting getting care. And we, we replaced it all out, mapped it to the legacy system. We're going to shut off the legacy system. This new iPad app was great. And then we found out that the the funding for it was like, done through an act of Congress. And if the legacy app went away, the funding went away. And so we couldn't like maintain the iPad app because the funding disappeared and we hadn't done the homework on it. And so there's all these little gotchas that I, I just, I learned so much in the process. So, yeah. So, so the, go ahead. The most strike, one of the most striking moments in uh, this blue button API we built was the, the lead engineer on the team, Sam Ginsburg. He, uh, you know, the, the first thing that he did as we started working on it was start looking at the the contract, understanding the budget, understanding where the money was coming from. And I was like, aren't, aren't we going to dig into the code and like figure out what's going on here and, and kind of start going and let's, you know, write some user stories and let's do some user research. And he was like, none of that matters until we're sure and we understand kind of deeply how this works. And that is a, a core kind of concept in working in government is really you know, most of the private sector ex experiences I've had, besides the startup world where you're you're really kind of looking at the books every single day, is the, the money would just kind of, a, you could just go do things and the money was there, you know, and, and if the executive wanted you to do that thing, you were never like tracing the budget back to the source. Like, it was just like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to do next on the roadmap. Where in government, you really have to understand the funding streams. And so when we started the Colorado Digital Service, um, I started it with a, a friend of mine, Matthew McAllister, who had worked for President Obama for five years and really understood kind of the, the in and out of how government worked. And that was key because he he could understand all the things that we had to do. To, whereas I was like, let's just go build stuff and, and try to solve problems. He he understood how to how to structure it right for success. And that's super key. Yeah, that's a important quality and skill. I I, I, I still have lots more to learn on that front. So was the blue button, did it achieve its objective or is it like an ongoing rolling thing? Yeah, it's it's ongoing forever. And that's what's been interesting about talking to folks in the state of Colorado about our own API efforts is, you know, these are not just, hey, let's just quick build it. They will come and we'll move on to the next project. You know, it's like you, you put these things out there in the world and they will be used forever. And uh, especially when it comes to things like personal health information and, um, and so with uh, the CMS Medicare Blue Button API, you know, we we intentionally started small. We you know gradually added more and more third-party app developers that we approved for access, as I was saying, and um, you know, went from a couple hundred Medicare beneficiaries that had connected their data to an app to you know now tens and hundreds of thousands, and and um, so that's kind of, you know, that, that ship is sailing and it's, it's, they continue to iterate there, you know, as the fire spec continues to mature like that, you know, the API has to continue to update and, and match the spec and the team is still strong and lots of great things are happening. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of this, which is, it's also pretty unique to government is um, 
as you know, this this Medicare API came out, um, the administrator of, of Medicare at the time said, hey, you know, we've done this now for Medicare. I would like regulation that regulates state Medicaid plans, Medicare Advantage plans, these plans on, on the exchanges called QHP plans to also do this. So this kind of shows you like this, you know, you talked about like the value of government. Government sometimes has these really unique roles, right? And one is some, sometimes government can help push standards forward. Sometimes government can use regulation to kind of create like data liquidity and, and do things that the, the market is not doing. And so that's what CMS did. They introduced this patient uh, interoperability, patient access and, and interoperability rule that said, you know, all of the various insurance plans that CMS oversees, like state Medicaid, uh, must build uh, these APIs. And it's not just the, the claims, as I mentioned, but there's also other things like provider directories and, and other things that kind of help healthcare data move around the system. So that's, in my view, has been the biggest success is, yes, lots of people are using the Medicare Blue Button to have access to their information and share it with whomever they like, um, but it also has really moved the industry forward, which is wonderful because it takes moving it forward on all these different fronts when it comes to health data interoperability to make progress because it's, it's such a gnarly bowl of spaghetti. Well, and I would add it, a third dimension is, mm -hmm. is the the precedent set by the, the, the patient access and interoperability rule, the regulations coming out of CMS is influencing other industries as well. And, and uh, similar to how PSD2 in Europe, um, which is a financial and banking uh, reg regulation out of the European Union, it's influencing regulation here in the US. It's, it, I just did a, an episode where we talked about uh, exporting PSD2 apps and, and processes to uh, Latin America, to Mexico, Brazil, Colombia. And so this type of regulatory currents really has, uh, uh, it, it's shifting the landscape in healthcare for sure, but it's, 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 it's much wider. And so, uh, so how does, where does the fire specification, the fast healthcare interoperability resources which is a standard. It's a mouthful and a standard. <laughs> um, where does how does that play in in with the, the the new CMS rules? Well, it's it is you know the standard that the healthcare industry is you know some move to and some moving to. Um, it is uh, specified in some of these regulations. Um, you know, with interoperability of anything, like the the standard play the key role. Right. Because without the standard, things can't, you know, gracefully and smoothly move around. Um, so it's been, it was really interesting while I was at the U.S. Digital Service working with CMS to watch the government's role in standards development. It's something I knew nothing about. I'd never worked in standards development before. Um, and to watch, you know, government, they invest in standards development. So an example is the, the Office of National Coordinator, which is the kind of the part of the of HHS that oversees like electronic medical records and, and things like that. Like a $15 million grant from the ONC is what created smart on fire, which is now a key piece of how third party apps run on top of electronic medical records. Um, so it was interesting seeing CMS, you know, provide funding for um, teams to build, you know, to, to be a part of fire working groups you know, in the fire standard, just like many standards, there's these various resources. And so one, you know, there's the financial working group that oversees like the, the health insurance claims resource. And there's resources for like every part of healthcare. And um, to watch CMS invest in that was a very, really cool thing. You know, code samples, documentation. Um, it, when you look at the fire documentation, you know, there's all sorts of use cases and things like that. And, and the there, there's a couple of people that are heroes in my book, um, Mark Scrimshire and others that have spent like their career making progress on, on this narrow part of the standard um, that opens up, you know, uh, it enables this opportunity for all sorts of things to work on top of the standard. So um, it was cool seeing government be a participant in that ecosystem. And, and there's many others too, like all the health insurance companies, you know, they were all kind of working on it. And, and it's, it, it ends up being like this, you know, this, this great group of people that are moving this part of it forward. So, yeah, again, I think that that, that provides a model 
for how to move other standards forward within other industries. I'm uh, going to be doing a few of these episodes on the Access Act, which is one of a suite of, of, of legis legislation that uh, Biden's pushing through right now. And it's going to uh, rein in the tech sector a little bit and, and apply APIs. But I would love to see the model that was applied to fire applied there uh, and 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 make it a, a nice balance between public and private sector and 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 get get all the folks at the table and and do it well because I I was I was involved at HHS um, in the early fire conversations because it, it was being used at uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and I didn't hold out a lot of hope early on because it really felt like a strong heavy-handed government play but then over over the years and then watching you I really saw uh, really smart people take it in the right direction and find the route right balanced to kind of end up where we're at today, which I think it's 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 respected. It's it's getting traction. I think this regulation is the the latest wave of it. I'm seeing it get adopted in the travel industry as as far as a, a COVID-19 pass uh, vaccine vaccination passport. I'm seeing talk of Europe Europeans starting to adopt it, even though it's a it's a U.S. Uh, North American standard. So I think it's it's pretty healthy, and I think the the CMS rules are really kind of you know just putting a lot of fuel on that fire. So that's good to hear that it's it's evolved out of the, out of the blue button work. So so what does this mean? Taking it down to your world now, what does this mean on the ground in Colorado? How does how does this play out? Yeah, well, a lot of the things you're mentioning are, are part of our day to day. So what you know we we touched for a second on the role of government. You know, so government as the data holder, you know, government, for example, has, um, you know, all the immunization data and each state rolls up to a, a central immunization registry that each state government manages. So we have our immunization information system here in Colorado. So do we have an immunization API? Because this is information that is belongs to the patient, you know, um, so patients should be able to easily access their immunization information. You see this. Um, in a variety of different ways from, you know, digital vaccine credential to logging into a, a, a some sort of immunization patient portal to view your records. My kids just, you know, we're halfway through the summer here and they've gone to a million different summer camps. Every single one of them, I've had to fill out the same forms, paper forms, faxed in forms, you know, I should just be able to share, you know, their immunization records with that camp using some sort of API experience, um, vital records, you know, these are things, government is the data holder on lots of different things. And I think that we see, you know, government unlocking a lot of this data for interesting uses in the moving forward, especially, you know, things like the CMS regulation, this uh, patient access and interoperability rule, you mentioned the word precedent before, that's what it does. So our Medicaid team now is, is working on compliance with this rule, like every other state is. So we're building these APIs. And that is just going to, you know, show the 17 other agencies in Colorado that are not Medicaid, the, the pattern, the playbook, you know, it's like, okay, here's the developer portal. Like here's, you know, how we handle API security. Like here's how we're thinking about identity and all of these things, you know? And, and so you'll start seeing more agencies around the government outside of healthcare um, start doing this as well. So here in Colorado, you know, our team specifically, we're working on a couple of really interesting things. Colorado voters passed a paid family leave program in November. So it's like this greenfield program um, will likely be an API first type of approach because it's a type of program that integrates with lots of businesses, you know, and, and so watching the state government look at the problem that way has been super interesting. Um, we continue to work on child welfare, which is a whole other kind of API discussion where you watch multiple agencies interoperate. So when child welfare, it's the Medicaid agencies involved, shares data with help, the human services agency, shares data with community providers, with corrections. You know, it's this big ecosystem of kind of internal APIs and watching that, that get more, more and more sophisticated here has been very interesting too. So those are a couple of things that um, you know, we're involved with it. It hasn't been the COVID, you know, craziness of the last year and a half. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it shows the power of APIs 
you know, from my vantage point that, you know, I think this is very much a healthcare API discussion, but it really shows the importance of interoperability when it comes to all of these, these areas. And in a mobile world where we're dependent on our mobile phones, why are we still faxing, you know, to the summer camps? You know, why are we still emailing and doing this? It's because government, you know, is traditionally, I would say five to 15 years behind, you know, where the rest of the sector is when it comes to a lot of these things. So that, it's not just modernization of government, it's reduction and, and reducing the, the bureaucracy and, and kind of improving on processes and all of that. So it's super important. So in, in Colorado, how much is this is government? How much is a, of it is, is private sector like stepping up to make things happen? You know, I, when I first uh, moved to DC to join the US Digital Service, I barely knew anything about government. And um, I walked in expecting, you know, tannish gray cubicles, software engineers, you know, working on with, you know, maybe older programming languages. And, uh, you know, really what I found was no software engineers, no product managers, no UX designers. It was, um, you know, a program manager or a deputy director that's a, or, or a project manager in charge of a multi-million dollar effort that was really high stakes, you know, and, um, and the private sector's role, um, in building government software is, you know, vendors build a lot of the government software. And one of the trends that you're seeing, you know, you referenced 10, five to 10, 15 years ago, I think that's exactly right. You just look to 2011, look at the sophistication of, of APIs across all, you know, um, industries and, um, you looked at kind of the evolution of product management. That was like a new thing. Like people were talking about like agile software development, like it was a new thing still. And that's very much how the day-to-day -day feels. But what you see in government is, you know, job titles like product manager, UX designer now coming into government. So that's been a, a, a really, really good thing. And you're seeing that kind of, it, it like, it creates government being like a better customer to the private sector companies that are building software on behalf of government. So a lot of people talk about big government, you know, and, and uh, government can't deliver and, you know, all the criticisms of government, but really what you see is, is understaffed. The, the, the civic pe gov tech people I see, they work harder than anybody I've ever worked with, including startup world folks. They're working usually two jobs, so they'll have like their full time role, like visiting clinics or or distributing vaccines, but then they're also a product owner on some team. Right. So they're overworked because there's not enough budget to fund those folks. But then a lot of the budget goes to the, the software that the vendors build. And so what we think is one of the secrets and the keys to to making government work better is strong product ownership you know, starting to see developer evangelists in government and roles like that, strong UX in government, that that helps the government understand better about, how, you know, become better at building software. So that's like the, you know, unemployment insurance systems, child welfare systems, like these huge systems that are never going away. You know, that's that's what you see. And then the second part of the private sector is like this massive ecosystem that wraps around government. So whether it's, you know, a network of community health organizations that actually provide, you know, these services to folks, or it's the development community that is building like, you know, apps and various things to, that, that help people. Um, or it's like the, you know, the citizen scientist, you know, thing like in COVID, you saw a ton of that where people were using open data. They were building like vaccine finders and, you know, all sorts of amazing stuff. COVID trackers came out of, you know, the, the tragedy of the COVID pandemic. And so that's this like wonderful ecosystem that, that wraps around government. Yeah. And I mean, you really touched on a number of things that are near and dear to my heart as far as my shift and how I see government. And I know you probably, you probably deal with this. I mean, Oregon, where I grew up is very similar to Colorado and trying to explain to people how government works. And once you have that realization and that intimate understanding that these are human beings working in these government offices. Like you said, they're often shorthanded. They, are, they, they don't always have the skills that are necessary to understand where things are, are at today in the modern ecosystem. They have the skills to do their job, but as far as 
you know, APIs, you know, the cutting edge with APIs and developer portals. And once you realize like, oh, to see the change that I want to see in government, I need to step up and like, like government's run by us. And, yeah. and, and trying to explain people that the reason why it appears dysfunctional is because there's not enough of us stepping up and doing this. And back to the, the, you know, calling people from the tech sector to join these digital services, it's because they don't have your, you, you know, I'm talking to our audience, your, your DX skills in government, go bring them there. You know, there's a reason the developer portals don't have the developer experience uh, that we're all looking for. And so that's like such a super, uh, a very important aspect of doing this is like these, these, uh, you hear revolving door when it comes to government a lot, but I think the digital services for me are the next generation, you know, version two or three of that revolving door and people coming into government and then going back and coming and maybe staying and, and doing this. So it, it really is a, a relationship. And then, so the other part I try to advise folks on is, is get, if you run a startup, spend the time to, uh, to find out what it takes to sell your services to government. And I'm doing this with Postman right now. Um, and right now we're, we're, you know, our free product gets used there, but uh, we do a lot of advising and consulting and we're, we're, we're trying, we're on our track for FedRAMP, which is like, you know, to get certified to sell to government. But I think there's just so many doorways that you can uh, get involved. So when it comes to the state level, cause I, I think, for a lot of us, the federal government is still very far away. DC is far away. But how can people get involved in in just APIs in general or tech in general in Colorado? What are some good ways for people to step up? Yeah, so in, in Colorado, we have a pretty strong uh, open data program. So we have this competition called Go Code Colorado that's run by the Secretary of State's office. Um, our chief data officer is, you know, is, an awesome advocate of, of all things APIs and we have developer.colorado.gov which you know continues to progress and um like I've mentioned the, the Medicaid API is coming soon um so that's that's like you know how you get involved I would say today it's mostly open data Colorado does a great job publishing open data this next chapter of transactional APIs you know PHI PII type of APIs like that's not fully baked yet that's coming that's like the next over the next five years as that you watch that mature. Um, you know, one observation of going from federal government to state government, and, and but is just how disconnected things are. First of all, um, you know, that was a, a shock. Actually, is really you know the state feels like the state, and DC feels far away. And when I was in DC, Colorado felt far away. And we never talked about like what was going on in Silicon Valley or anything. It was all about what was happening right there in DC. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Um, and you actually see people, some uh, legislators and Congress and so on talking about like how to fund kind of these teams that help glue together different parts of government, which is very interesting. So again, in the state of Colorado, you know, one of the things that we worked on right out of the gate as COVID hit was, was the contact tracing system. So in Colorado, we have 64 counties and of those 64 counties, we have a, uh, 53 local public health agencies. So some counties team up and create a local public health agency. And that's really as close to kind of the end user, if you will, you can be. The local public health agency is the one that is doing the real work of helping people. And um, and all the other layers kind of contribute to that, that final thing where the local public health agency is running that vaccination clinic or whatever. And um, so all the counties, you know, in order for contact tracing to work, Right. When I'm here in Denver and I go skiing in Summit County and then I come back to Denver, like I've now traveled across three or four counties that day, you know, and, and so counties need to be able to interoperate. And it's such a great example of, um, you know, the different layers of government, because in, if the state of Colorado can only do so much in state government, it's really about the counties and what the counties want to do and how the counties work together. And it, so it's it just continues to layer down. So. As people get involved with with government, you know, think about it that way. It's not just going to the U.S. Digital Service or 18F and moving to D.C. or or working remotely for one of those groups. It's um, you know the your like your cities. Um, City of Denver has a great team, you know, and uh, counties. Um, there's all sorts of of efforts like you know Code for America where they have brigades in every city. 
There's a code for Denver. There's a code for Boulder, code for Fort Collins, code for Colorado Springs. There's groups like the U.S. Digital Response, which is um, a, a group of like 6,000 engineers and, and product managers and UX designers that are, you know, helping government at all levels. Like there's a bunch of stuff um, and a bunch of different ways you can get plugged in. Yeah, I second that. I mean, a lot of folks, I think, over the last few years have kind of gone back home trying to figure out how they can do things at a local level. I, I second what you said about the open data kind of being the doorway and, and kind of the gateway to a lot of this world. Uh, start start small, visit your local, you know, and whether it's your city or your county, I would recommend at that level, um, even over the state or the federal, and pick one data set build something, uh, build a visualization on it, clean it up a little bit, publish it, you know, if it's a CSV or if it's a spreadsheet, uh, publish it as JSON on GitHub, tell the story of it, maybe uh, do a presentation around it, and then get to know the ecosystem and understand, well, who published that data? What's being done with it? How can I help kind of maybe reduce, reduce load there? And then you'd be surprised what you learn. And you would meet people, you'll learn processes, you'll realize that there's human beings in your local county office, not, not just the nameless, faceless things. I think the the media and a lot of public want you to think. So, you know, definitely start small and and figure, you know, uh, uh, do that. What What sort of skills are you guys looking for with digital services as, you know, you guys are looking to evolve your team and help? Uh, other stakeholders be more successful? What kind of skills are needed most? Yeah, so, so for our team, it's it's product UX and engineering, you know, and it's it's really broad because especially for engineering, you know, as you come in, it's, it's you know, a bad fit is, hey, I'm really good at this one language, you know, and I'm going to come in and help because it's more like there, there's, I think in, in the state of Colorado, we have 300, what we classify as enterprise applications. So these are things that are multi, multiple millions of dollars, you know, tens of thousands or more of users of over 300 of those. So you basically, you see like every single language, you know, in every single platform across the state. Um, so that's our team specifically. Um, but across the government, um, you, like I was saying before, you see a really strong need for product management um, I think that uh, data science and uh, DevRel are like the next two job titles you see in government. One of the big problems in, in government, one of my big soapboxes is the job titles are miserable. So you have like, you know, business analyst number four and what they really want is a product manager, you know, and business analyst number four is a position for $41,000 a year. And what they really need is a product manager for one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. You know, and and by the way, the, this person is going to be in charge of a fifty million dollar program. You know, so it's it is so out of whack, and um, and that's one of the things our team has really been advocating for is is to you know modernize. So, and this is every team, you know, all these div digital services teams and so on. Like this is changing now in government. So I think that you start seeing more data scientists come on, um, and DevRel I think is going to be a, a new frontier. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the fire standard, some of the other things, but that is just one piece of it. I mean, that's like the, the foundation, but then, you know, wave a wand in the state of Colorado has a couple of APIs, then what? Like now the, this business side of it all is, um, I think going to be a big challenge for states because vendors can build, vendors can map data to fire, vendors can provide APIM. Vendors can provide security and, you know, operations and all of that, but it needs to be the state that provides the evangelism, the product leadership, the product vision to align with the programs and the legislation that's, you know, and the people they're building for. Um, so that I feel like, you know, and that's every level of government from federal all the way down to, you know, the smallest town will be experiencing this, I think, over the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, I can't second the DevRel thing enough, and I I owe you some work in this area. I'm going to do some 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 segments on this, trying to plow other folks that I know who do evangelism, developer relations in government, and then some folks in the private sector who who are are, are leaders. Like we 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 were talking before we started the show about Adam Duvander, who 
uh, was on one of our episodes before and has a book called uh, Developer Marketing Does Not Exist. But he's a, a, a DevRel expert and, and how, you know, the importance of storytelling, the importance of, of connecting with people. Um, and I didn't realize until I went to government, I knew this in the private sector, but I didn't know the benefit of this in federal government and, and all levels of government is just having someone who will show up to meetings and then cross pollinate ideas against uh, other groups, connect people. Hey, did you know so-and-so is working on this over there and you should talk to so-and-so. And I started going to, you know, I'd go to uh, Department of Commerce uh, gatherings, uh, tech gatherings in DC and someone would get up from a, a, a API group within Department of Commerce and say, hey, we've done this API project, it's been great. We've gotten a lot of attention, but we've only gotten two real actual users of, of it. And we're probably gonna deprecate the API after a while because we just didn't get the demand we were looking for. And then someone in the audience goes, um, I'm with the National Oceanic uh, Administration and we're one of those users. Please don't deprecate that API because it's like super critical to this program and this program and this program. And they didn't know, they didn't talk. Yeah. You know, and that's an example of, I think how developer relations really uh, is pretty powerful. And so, if someone's listening here, you know, you don't have to have hardcore tech experience and be a coder to, to do developer relations. It really is a people job. And so I would love to uh, kind of explore that. And I'll probably be reaching out to you in the future, Kelly, to, to talk more, you know, um, to kind of get some of that because I, I want to create some content that people can watch. I know healthcare providers, government agencies, many are trying to figure all this out right now and they just don't understand why are documentation important? You know, what do developers need? All of that. So um, it's a pretty critical area. And, and I'll, yeah. yeah, and I, I would suggest people check out um, the VA, the Veterans Administration has a project called Lighthouse. So if you Google VA Lighthouse, you'll find some really cool stuff. And then uh, developer.cms.gov and bluebutton.cms.gov. That's good examples of kind of what's happening today. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be the model. You know, the Blue Button team, since the very beginning when I was involved, we have a full-time developer evangelist on that team. And that was one of the, the keys to success. And, um, so I yeah. totally agree with you, Ken. Yeah, those are, those are great models. Thanks for sharing those. I like those. So zooming back out a little bit, getting back to, I, I would say, uh, the Kelly of all of this. Why do you care about API so much? <laughs> Um, you know, these, these technologies and, and these approaches that, you know, can create these combinatorial effects as Elliot Turner from Alchemy used to say, and these things that, that unlock like more ideas, I've always been drawn to that. Um, you know, we, I, I think some of my first kind of real experiences with consuming APIs, there's a company in Boulder called Ginip, one of my favorite companies ever that became the Twitter data team. And companies like that, um, you know, where we were building a social media monitoring platform way back when and, and just being able to go into to GNIP and be like, okay, you know, like I would have an idea coming into work and go and, and then partially build that idea by the afternoon. And that, that really, you know, ha has stayed with me for now a decade later. Um, and so that's really, like really what draws me to this type of thing. I, and the more I've been involved with this stuff, the more I've gotten involved with the government stuff, you know, this idea of, of data that belongs to somebody else being held somewhere and not being available, that like doesn't feel right at all anymore. And, in, and as you look across the world, you can see like a bunch of examples of that, like whether it's the data from your car, the, your own personal health information, like the data from your house, like that, like all of that stuff is gradually starting to, you know, it's unlocking. And um, this data liquidity is happening everywhere. And I and I think that, you know, the fu the fundamentals of APIs and, and um, how it stitches things together um, is what's making that stuff possible. So I continue to be drawn to it. Yeah, you, you touch on one of the, the heart of the part that I, keeps me interested, but I also get disillusioned sometimes is the, the phrase the API economy is used to describe this. And over the last decade, I hear that word get used a lot. And most of the time it, it's applied directly to an API, meaning you build an API, people will come and, and you'll generate revenue and 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 the world's more more better off because of it. But that's not the API economy in my mind. It's the things that multiple APIs enable 
uh, you know, that that exponentially, that innovation, that growth, that new, entirely new things. You know, it's it's how Twilio, you know, Twilio has done fine selling SMS services, but it's it's the the gig economy, the sharing economy, the services that got us through COVID that were built on the Twilio API. You know, it's the COVID notification. It's it's my vaccination center being more organized because of COVID because of the Twilio API. It's that type of enablement that I see as being the the API economy, and that's that's what keeps me me you know paying attention to this is what's that what's that next thing what's going to happen what's what's someone going to do that i didn't even think of and i've been thinking about apis for a long time so i yeah i, I second that and i think that the role of government here you know the government will never build like i always call those like functional apis i'm sure that's the wrong phrase but you know the the stuff that we were doing at Alp alchemy api and then and then ibm watson like these these they, you know, it, it, it performs some sort of function when you hit the API, you know, whether it's NLP or computer vision, you know, image tagging or whatever. I don't see, ever see the government having anything like that. It's more like that the government is going to be like the transacting with type of stuff, you know, like making it easier for businesses to do things, maybe tax related things, who knows. And then, then the government is the data holder unlocking. And, um, I, I, you know, I think that that's like going to be the role of government, you know, with a little with open data stuff kind of as a sidecar um yeah. moving forward yeah agreed so uh more on the personal level you live in colorado uh where's your favorite place to hike in colorado well um yeah we're we're here in denver right down the street from boulder where chautauqua park in boulder is you know been my love for 30 years now we've been here it's pretty crazy um one of my favorite people in the world, Susanna Fox, who was the CTO of HHS uh, years years ago, and kind of the person that got me into the government stuff. Um, just from her, from a quick phone call, um, we had a hike there the other day. She was in town on vacation. So one of the nice things about living in a place where people vacation is people are always coming through. So you get to meet up and, and kind of bump into and go hiking with with folks um, as they travel through places like Boulder. Yeah, that's a uh, I. I I'm I'm in a place where people come through in the Bay Area, but it's not for the nature vacation. It's the other <laughs> side of that, so uh, I I'll, I have to work harder at that balance. But the Sierra Nevadas is as a quick drive for me, so that's similar. <laughs> um, nice. So how do you how do you balance your your world, you know, in technology with with nature and and find that balance for you and your family? Yeah. So for you know for us the the COVID stuff, just like everybody was was a, a very interesting year and, and with our team um you know we were able to do some kind of outside hanging out time which is really nice and and we do try to you know, the government stuff the work-life balance has been the biggest uh struggle i've ever had working in government because it, i always tell people that are like coming into government or are thinking about it like one of the crazy things about it is the relevancy so i wake up every morning listening to our local npr station here and um it is stories about things that I'm going to be working on that day. And uh, you're surrounded by it 24 seven. You know, if you meet up with friends, they ask you about, you know, state of Colorado government things, family asks you. So it's just like, it's kind of like the startup world where it is basically becomes your identity. And um, so, you know, here in Colorado, getting outside, skiing, hiking, running, you know, all of those things have just or continue to be key always. And that's true for our whole team. Um, we all have our own kind of activities like that. Um, but it is, a, it is a thing, you know, especially in COVID, especially in public health. You know, one of the stories this year across the United States has been the burnout of public health civil servants. You know, whether it's, it's um, harassment, which we had that here in Colorado, to um, total burnout. You know, this, this feeling of, of ultimate responsibility of everyone around you to be vaccinated, to be, you know, free of COVID and all these things, it's taxing. Um, so we do constantly talk about it on the team. You know, this afternoon is our staff meeting here for the Colorado Digital Service and we'll check in with each other. And we have all sorts of techniques using emojis and animated GIFs and things like that we use to kind of, you know, communicate with each other about how we're feeling. And But it is super important. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. And I would say, I have a lot of friends in the tech sector. I've had a few 
check-ins with with folks that are burning out and saying, "Oh, I'm I'm done with the tech sector," and I'm using that as an opportunity to say, you know, one check in on them. Hey, how are you doing? Make sure you you get some time away, but also, hey, have you considered maybe going and working on some more meaningful problems? And government could use your help. So I'm using it as an opportunity there, but uh, you know, I want to be honest with folks about that that these challenges exist on both sides of the tracks, but um, it's it's all about finding that balance. And, you know, it, in government, one of the most interesting things is you're building for everyone, you know, and so that's, that it's been fascinating. You know, every single person you pass on the street is probably interacting with the government system, you know, and so the, the health equity questions, like the accessibility stuff, it is foundational to everything you work on. And then you kind of square that with scale, you know? So we, one of the, the efforts that we worked on was called exposure notifications with Apple and Google. You know, you turn this on, it, it comes baked into the Apple iOS settings and, and it's an app you can download from the Play Store on Google. And, and uh, you know, two and a half million Coloradans activated this on their phone and it was used, you know, tens of thousands of times when someone would test positive for COVID they would use it to then notify people that they had been, you know, potentially had exposed. And um, so you walk around and, and everyone I talk to is turn this thing on their phone. They're using it. So th this scale is, and that's just in the state, you know, when you go to the federal government, you're talking about the whole country, you know, you just keep going up and up in scale. So it is definitely not like, a, you know, take a quick break and go from the tech sector to government. It's more the other way around, you know, yeah. um, where it's like, Hey, would you like to come make less money and, and have a tougher <laughs> job, you know, but, but the thing about it is, you know, is the, the impact and the mission. The, is, the uh, purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the angle I'm trying to get is the purpose. It definitely it's not more pay. It's definitely not less work. Um, it's, it's the, the purpose and the meaning and trying to find, you know, why are we doing this tech? Cause that's, that's the biggest challenge I, or struggle I've had with technology is why, why am I doing this? Why am I making an impact? And when I went to DC, I, that scope you talk about, I was just blown away. I mean, I worked at big tech companies and I, the scope is, is much, much greater. So and you know, another part of this too is uh, with government, we always describe it as, is this relay race because it, it is like you, you work on something like the child welfare system and it's like your turn to make a difference Yeah, and, yeah. You, and you make a difference and then you hand it to the next person and it's yeah. now it's their turn and that's how things will be forever. So it gives you this interesting perspective, you know, like as we're ramping up various API efforts here, I know that this is like the beginning of something that in, in 10 years I'll be checking back on, you know, I had an interesting experience at the, the HIMSS conference, big healthcare conference, where when we launched the, the CMS Blue Button API, um, people would come up to me, we were doing booth duty, you know, and they'd be like, hey, I just wanted to say hello. I, you know, I worked at CMS eight years ago and we helped get the Blue Button going. And, you know, it, it just really reminded me that it is, it does take a village and it, it is all of us, you know. And it's a journey. It's, a, yeah. it's definitely a journey. Well, thank you. I'm stoked to have been on this journey with you and our paths keep crossing um, and, and I'm guessing they will continue. But uh, I want to thank you for your time today. Great conversation. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day and, and hope you get outside and enjoy some of that beautiful <laughs> weather. Will do. All right. <laughs>